Okay, and here we are again. And you know, I'm super excited. I just, I feel so. I don't know. I just feel like I, I, I can do. Well, I know I can do so much, and it's just like this whole talking thing is, is it always gets to me. But you know, I'm okay. I just, I just feel like explosive. Like I just, you know, I need to be out physically somewhere. But you know, it's, it's cool to, to be on the line and to be transmitting with everyone. But you know, I look forward to the day that we can all get together in person because it's just so much different. And me personally, I'm actually like a real people person. Like I, I tend to um, be a lot more pronounced when I'm around people, and, and I can get things done. And um, so I'm looking to let 2016 manifest that. But it's been uh, quite a road because everything you want to do, you know, it, it takes some cash. It takes some resources. So I've had to become very um, innovative at, you know, how I can, you know, keep growing something like this because it doesn't actually appeal to many people for different reasons. And the listeners, yes, but just people who are who may be able to assist or to help, you know, there's always one thing or another, like either it's their Jesus or, you know, maybe you, you did you should have been pro black or, you know, whatever the case, it's always something. So what you find yourself doing is, you know, you find yourself doing it. So but when we're all together physically and then we can start to feel each other's energy more, then I, I understand that there's going to be a massive explosion. So or implosion, as I should say, I should. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. So to the next question. So Greg Whitaker asks, what is my take on using a float tank or deprivation tank for deeper spiritual work like John Lilly was reported to do? Of course, I love John Lilly's work. You know, one of the first people to communicate with dolphins and those books are actually available. John Lilly is no longer with us, but all of his works are available and, and they're actually free. Like I pulled down a massive John Lilly torrent one time and it con- uh, contained all of his work. So um, the statement was you can't tell where your body ends and the water begins. The, t- the tank consists of 800 pounds of Epsom salt, which is magnesium and 200 gallons of water at 93 degrees, and the tank is placed in total darkness with no sound. And so the answer to that question is for us always to remember that the poison is also the cure. It's, also, it's always about the alchemist or the one putting the formula together, because we just talked about earlier how you know, getting the senses off balance could cause some situations. However, in the case of the deprivation tank, what we'll be surprised to see is how when there's no gravity, the effects on our consciousness in zero G or anything close to it, it really makes the system akin to experiencing no resistance especially in relation to the organs and the chakras. So believe it or not, you know, even just sitting down, there's a lot of weight on the back, the spine and on the organs. Likewise, even laying down because the gravity, you know, is always going to push and then activate certain muscles that we have just to stabilize ourselves. So when you get yourself into one of these deprivation tanks, you find that, you know, you get into this whole different state of consciousness because you truly dull any of the senses completely. Mainly that, well, actually I say when you, when you dull, any of the senses completely allows us to focus more onto other senses. So you can experience this even if you don't have a deprivation tank by just getting some earplugs. I always tell people, go get some of those earplugs, the soft ones, stuff them in your ear and go to sleep and watch how things change with your dream world, how peaceful the body is when you wake up because you'd be surprised how many vibrations and sounds go on during the night that disturb you from different levels of your sleep, even the frequency. So when you get those earplugs in, you get a chance to experience a whole different level of quietness within your body, especially when you do that for a prolonged period of time, like eight hours, six hours, five hours, whatever. So also I talk about the, the more physical, the more physical senses that you shut down, the higher our spiritual perception becomes. So when you turn off the sound and the light and then the gravity, then this, you get this higher spiritual perception because the body doesn't need to send any kind of energy into those, um, how can I say, you know, in, into those outlets or into those uh, those parts of your consciousness. So and also magnesium is a great conductor, a great part of the body consists on the magnesium system. And in fact, that's one of the main things that we're going to be rolling out. Hopefully by the end of this year is I have an amazing blend of magnesium and zeolite that I'm working with that is proved to not only reduce uh, tissue, but also increase absorption of minerals. But, you know, that's something that, that I've been working on and it's finally coming to completion. But 
magnesium is a great conductor. So when you're laying in that magnesium, every time the body pulses, which you get familiar with in meditation, then it reverberates and it actually sends it back into the body rather rapidly. So thumbs up on the deprivation tank. Obviously, it's a quite extensive setup, but some people, especially if you're in the U.S., you can actually find uh, places that rent these tanks. So you know, definitely uh, something to check out. So Christoph uh, Berdorf asks, how do I work on my aura from a physical level beyond Taoist methods, meditations, etc.? So the first thing I wanted to do, you know, just to get things clear really briefly here to, is to define the aura. Like what is the aura? Okay. And the aura is, of course, the light spectrum of our physical and mental existence conveyed via frequency. And the reason why I say it's physical, mental, and some, you know, you can incorporate it definitely into spiritual because even the term aura itself actually connects right into the spiritual. But it does consist of our physical and mental existence because you can physically raise the color of your aura. Like even if you go take a jog outside and then, you know, you've worked yourself up, there's a lot more current and vibration running through the body. And this increases the profoundness of the aura. Same thing also with the mental is many people always say, you know, we'll visualize this uh, white light. And that's generally done through the mind. The mind tries to visualize this light and then they can feel their frequency picking up. You can even think of raising your frequency if you can hear it in your ear and you think of it, you can even raise it. So this again shows us that there is a connection between the mind, body and soul Despite, you know, we live in the mind, body and soul every day, many keep trying to separate these three, but they are very much connected. So the higher current or vibration that we generate, the more vivid and defined the aura becomes. And I've seen that on different levels. You know, even when somebody takes one of those uh, aura raising, vibratory raising substances, you can see their aura actually get much more profound. So the aura has various colors because there's different parts of the chakra system and those different parts of the chakra systems have different orbits, thus different vibratory speeds. And we talked about this the last um, show, but just to, to understand, this is not anything fanciful. It's just like a lighter. You see the lighter has a blue, it has a red, and that's all based on the vibratory frequency of the burn off of the fuel. So it's the same thing with the body. The root chakra has generally that red color. The lower chakras have that brown color. You know, the crown chakra has that indigo or violet color. And it's because the actual orbits and the vibration of that particular chakra becomes more finer. So it's almost like a pulley system. So this is and then so you have the vibratory frequency and then you have when the vibratory frequency is amplified, then the colors become more vivid. And then also when the when the vibratory frequency is very dense or very slow, it's almost undefined. And then also if a person is uh, only working with maybe one chakra, then you see that they're only defined by that one color of that chakra. So anyone who can really see into these chakras can really tell so much about a person, much more than anything that you would ever get from talking to them or uh, anything of that nature. You would get way more in just looking at the aura, looking at the colors on the aura because you could see what's developed, what's underdeveloped, what kind of energy system the person's working with. I mean, a plethora of data by just examining the person's aura. Um, With that being said... Since the organs are attached to the uh, chakras and the vibratory fields of the body, cleaning them, since he asked, you know, what are the physical levels of that you can do to increase your aura? Cleaning them will will reduce um, the, you know, (laughs) sorry, I just, I'm getting, I'm I'm all hyped up and then I'm having to go through some of this, this text, but cleaning them will uh, actually produce vivid results to your aura. So this means that if you do internal cleansing, if you do even colon cleansing, you allow the sh- the chakra or the organ itself to vibrate at a higher frequency. So that increases the aura. So you can use either the complete internal cleansing, there's cleanse methods on the internet such as the kidney cleanses, etc. and then this gives you a st- and then with the internal cleansing kit it gives you a step-by-step process of how to clean it. And then also just if you want to go right in and see, hey, does this even really work? You definitely want to go for a colon cleanse at least because that's one of the major chakras of the body. And that's the one that generally powers the rest of the chakras. So 
The next question is, is that I know you talk a lot about frequencies. What is your opinion on frequency vibratory medicine using quantum feedback and bioresonance to send healing frequencies to realign the body and in turn someone's health? What about the core energetics machine? So uh, personally, I've demoed out quite a few of the bioresonance machines, especially in my advent at the Institute here in Costa Rica. Um, there was a plethora of machines, even some of them that run into the thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 range. And it was quite clear to me that they do do something. Um, what I found was is that the software, though, it tended uh, tend to be the part of what was the most stagnant. And it's because there seems to be still only a little knowledge available, especially even by the creators of some of these machines, of what exactly these frequencies do and how they should be applied. Like, applied. like what is the gate? You know, there's how many times that you open the gate of the frequency and the herd sine wave versus square wave. So that, you know, frequency is not just frequency. You know, there's different modula, there's different modulations. And I think that that's why frequency becomes such a broad topic for us because, you know, there's frequency that comes out of your radio, but there's also frequencies that are um, that you can't see. And, you know, and there, so there's different kind of frequencies, microwave frequencies, et cetera. So me personally, um, I, so I think that the software, a lot of the software is still in beta. But what I found was the most effective part of these devices was a grid based antenna system that generally if you pulled apart in these bioresonance feedback pads or whatever, that they had an antenna that actually was meshed into generally some kind of plastic work. But just because of that, that antenna was very effective at interfacing with the body. So again, there's quite a bit of research on the frequency on frequencies out there. And I'm just beginning to delve into a lot of what goes on with dosimetry um, that's D O S I M E T R Y. If anyone wanted to check it out, and then the bioelectromagnets, which is of course seeing how the body reacts to the bioelectric system and bioelectric magnetic system, which again NASA has done a lot of research on because of needing to understand how frequencies affect people, especially in space. Uh, and in the conclusion of that, uh, for the person that asked that question, I did also go to the core energetic site, and unfortunately, it was down, so I wasn't able to verify the kind of tech that they were using. Um, the next question by Patrick Samuels is asking, is the purpose of secret energy to break free of the reincarnation process and become a soul sovereign or, do, and does the course, which he's speaking of the university course, does that prepare students specifically for this? And what I'll say is that the purpose of secret energy is vast. It caters to neophytes and adepts alike. This has been six years, almost seven years now of knowledge and really not repeating the same thing too many times, but always coming into major breakthroughs as we do every show. Um, so I would say the core of our work, though, is sovereignty because we've taught people since the beginning how to get rid of these external ideas of a God and to begin to understand which is, you know, the term it says for, says everything, uh, to begin to understand that more about your multidimensional self. So the course itself at the university is a methodical introduction to every aspect of how to achieve that. It was a time in which I've taken the top topics itself of what I feel like encompasses total awakening and then putting it into some kind of order and introducing that. And many people have been elated about the information that's there and it's been more than fulfilling the next question is is why does the construct have a reincarnation process like this and what is even the point is this something we should be weary about entering just after death is the purpose for or is the purpose for greater good and the answer to that question is i suggest that you check check out uh the thorough part of the keymaker series even going back to the beginning and then coming back to episode number five because i really get into the whole reincarnation thing and what it's about in greater depth than i've really seen anyone cover so we even get into uh professional reincarnation so definitely check out those previous episodes Okay, so the next thing is, is that T says, and I'm just using that T because it is a somewhat of a personal question, so I didn't want to say the person's name even though they said that I could, 
But uh, T, you know who you are. They ask, uh, I'll say it verbatim what they ask. T says, I just had a question regarding toxic, toxic relationships. I'm currently in an intimate relationship three years now with someone who's very spiritually asleep and in which I'm constantly engaging in arguments, fights, and constant negative energy. However, when we are not being bogged down by this energy, I feel a deep connection to this person that my heart simply cannot let go of. And although I'm exper- I'm ex- I've experienced love before, I've never felt quite as connected. It's very intense, and it's making it difficult for me to make clear-headed decisions. As a result, at times I feel weak and at the whim of this person. And I was wondering if you could give any advice of exactly what what this type of relationship is. Both of our highs and lows are incredibly intense. And I was wondering how you can actively break those sort of cycles in relationships and begin to achieve mutual growth, particularly where the person you're with has had a history of trauma, abuse, and are spiritually cut off, but with a very powerful energy nonetheless. And I thank you for the syntax of that because it allows me to actually read it straight through. Um, so the first answer to that is, as we discussed in, in previously um, in other questions, that there is other aspects to our being than just physicality, so, such as mentally and spiritually. So if at all those aspects are not kept in the balance, there will be extreme off-balances, which, we can, which can, be like the war, it can be like a warped wheel or warped chakra. So relationships are, are the most difficult for us to make drastic, drastic decisions in because we can become very complacent in those relationships. In fact, overall, we're very complacent beings. We would rather um, leave things the way that they are than to rock the boat and cause any kind of major changes. This is also why people stick to religious structures and you know, stick to just dealing with whatever is going on in their life versus trying to, like I said, rock the boat and change things because it will make things drastically not only it will not only make things drastically change but there will be a period of time before the person can rebound and then actually find themselves into a comfortable position again so we kind of like fear that in many tenses so that's is what keeps us into these relationships so what i say is so it's only when we desire total liberty and the, and value it over anything else can we make decisions in life that are long overdue because we have these pending situations, and this is not even just in relationships. It can come in, in many different shapes and forms. And it's only when you know, you're know you in bed at night and then you're actually like tired of seeing yourself in that cycle. But not only that, you start to value being out of that cycle more than being in it. And, and some certain things spark a person to begin to make those decisions. And sometimes those things that happen are sometimes negative. Uh, you know, maybe just, you know, over explosive arguments, someone's hit the other person, you know, these kind of things. So we do want to understand the nature of ourselves. You know, it's just like telling someone sometimes that you need to stop doing a certain thing and then they can't stop doing it until something drastic happens and they stop doing it. Why other people are like, well, before something drastic happens, let me just cut it off. So I think by even reading the question yourself over again, you can kind of understand the aspect of what you're dealing with and how that's benefiting you as a spiritual being because it's not allowing you to make the decisions that you know you need to make as being a sovereign. So the question continues and T says that I, I wanted to discuss addiction. Currently, I'm addicted to both cigarettes and weed, and I'm using it on a daily basis, mostly while hanging with friends and playing music and watching documentaries. And I feel as though in the spiritual realm, these things are st- stigmatized and not talked about. Obviously, I know the importance of looking after these, this body. However, I developed these habits when I was younger, and they're beginning to trap me. Although I'm only 21 at the moment, my addictions are inhibiting me from being able to in, engage fully in spiritual practice. I was hoping you could discuss what addiction is from a spiritual perspective and effective pro- processes to breaking addiction. Now, the first thing that I will uh, enlighten you about is that, remember, a lot of our addictions are actually hereditary. So we can be experiencing addictions from even ancestral connections, meaning, you know, great, great, great grandmother and their addictions to certain things. So be aware of that. And also understand the root and the cognate of the word drug is dragon. So I don't necessarily put marijuana in the same category as 
tobacco, even though they are, are actually not just tobacco, because even the cigarettes that are out today is not just tobacco. So, you know, it's very important to, to do distinguish between one from the other. However, addiction is an addiction and it does remove power from your consciousness. If some reason is you say, well, I'm not going to do this no more, but you can't find yourself, you can't find the energy to not do it. So, um, we don't want to overlook, though, those imbalances that were mentioned earlier, especially in regards to the relationship, because when we have an imbalance going on in one place, it somehow in, acts out in another way that we may not understand. Like we talked about last show, how just the child being isolated in the hospital during that first period of time that it comes out of the womb can lead to that child being very... Um, clingy, let's say, later on in life, especially in the female to the male tense. So there are many things that we experience earlier in life that act, act out in a totally different way. We've got about five minutes here, so I've got to speed through this. So I'm just going to read through. So oftentimes when we use substances in conjunction with things uh, we like to do with the body and the mind, that somehow the body and the mind get hardwired to believing that it has to do that whole formula in order for it to achieve that type of enjoyment. So this can kind of be dangerous. So you like documentaries, you like hanging out with the friends, you like music. So then when you throw smoking and you throw weed into it, the body starts to think because it's still accepting the program. The body is highly programmable. The mind is programmable. We've witnessed that with MK Ultra. you know, even the biorhythmic clock of waking up at a certain time in the morning. So understand everything is programmable with the mind and the body. So the mind and the body can say, well, you know, I need this formula in order to even have fun because I enjoy to do all these together. So the more we incorporate these still addictive substances with new things, the more we increase the dependency because our life is often full of new things, hearing new information, et cetera. So, you know, if we're doing these addictive drugs and then listening to new knowledge, somehow the body and the mind say, well, shoot, you know, I, I only can get this level of knowledge when I'm in this formula, right? So, be, be careful of that. The only real solution I found is to dry it up, quit 22 days. Um, I think in everything you understand that AA, Alcohol Anonymous, actually contains the formula of getting uh, overcoming addictions, right? And so many of the things about it, like you have to first accept that it is addiction, are actually rooted in even spiritual principles. So especially with the cig cigarettes, because I understand cigarettes to be more of a configuration for negative energies that they're actually like, I used to call them the devil's incense, you know, not to, you know, do the God and devil thing, but they do bring around a certain kind of energy. So you do want to be really cautious of that. So during the 22 days, you should focus on how much more powerful you are than these substances. And there will be a battle, but you will prevail, especially if you set it up like that, like you're actually in this battle with these substances. And this allows you to gain more levels of self-mastery, even if you do, let's say, decide to you know, smoke a joint every now and then after that, it will be a totally different kind of perspective that you gain from that experience. So I'm going to see exactly. Somebody did comment that Iboga does help with addictions. And I will agree that Iboga, uh, especially in micro doses, you don't have to actually go through the whole Iboga experience, but through micro doses, focus more like a, a very uh, strong fatherly kind of uh, energy. And so it has a tendency to come in and to really set your mind straight and to really let you see your level of being, where you're at, what's going on. And then in conjunction with all these substances who are like minors compared to who you really are. So definitely a, a good uh, point to bring up. So Three, uh, four more minutes left. I'll keep going. So Sean asked, Mr. Bomar, I wanted to please, to please ask a question regarding ceremonial magic. Uh, Dr. Israel Rigardi has two very important rituals that pertain to contact on uh, of our guardian angels. And one is called the Holy Guardian Angel. And the second is called the Middle Pillar Ritual. And both allow the individual to elevate and go through doors, uh, doorways, as you would say, to Jehovian base energies. And does the Keymaker series have any techniques that can help me in the conquest to know before going far down the rabbit hole to be safe and effective and not rely on ceremonies from the 1930s? And uh, to answer that question, just so we don't leave off with an unanswered question, I will say that, first of all, that's what they claim. They claim to elevate, but that's actually not what's happening. The first, it's first examine the idea itself. So through ritual, which involves ev uh, evocation of various energies, we are supposed to gain contact with a guardian angel who by the term is protecting us throughout our life. And those who, are, and those who have followed along these lines 
of this ritual, such as Crawley, who has his own ritual stating to do the same thing, quotes the absence of his bodily, mental and astral consciousness is indeed cardinal to success. So you would need to understand just from that statement alone that you would actually be leaving yourself open to possession. There would be actually no one at the will for a specific period of time and something could indeed inhabit your consciousness. Um, So in truth, this is a ritual for possession. And at minimum, it will cause a debased state of dependency and servitude toward other ideals and dark minds. Because again, if you leave yourself susceptible to believing something like this is true, then it actually leaves you more prone to being programmed. So in short, in short, the genie in the bottle, uh, this is the genie in the bottle approach. So for many, it doesn't seem logical that clearing the mind of the idea that external entities are in control and meditation and better dieting will have more effects than dark magic. However, this is a fact, meaning it is a fact that if you engage in meditation and, I, and, and leave the idea of external entities alone and get better dieting, you will have more progress than this stuff could ever deliver to you. And I go on that the danger of the ritual is actually getting bound to its ideals. That's why it's called a ritual and it must be done over and over again to, affect, to actually program you. So the society is full of this kind of thing, and especially on TV. Ceremonial magic is designed to attract those vulnerable in the gross, to the grossest ideals, meaning those who are more ready, readily able to be programmed. We must be aware of its origins and not fall into the trap of thinking a few words will create the change we are looking for. We must get familiar with the process of tapping into our inner self via the guidelines constantly laid out through the duration of this message. And this actually brings us to the end of today's message. But we will be joining each other again next Saturday. And we'll be getting more explosive. We'll be answering some more of these questions and we'll be revealing some of the deepest keys to our experience here, not only on Earth, but also beyond, because that's what we're all about. Feeling proud, look at me now, raw died and taking cleanses. I stay away from creeps, bad meat and doctor syringes. Being mostly all gas, my body feels tremendous. Did I mention when I sleep, I enter different dimensions? All in self, because the vision can never equal the extension. If you listen, you really can come and get what you've been missing. I be wishing that you were just right here next to me, chilling. But this road keep calling my soul, saying to get it, so I'm gone from city to city, hoping they feel it. Can I kick it? I'm paying.